get to it. Uh, Mr. Secretary, uh, let me just start with you. What does this mean? Uh, why did it happen? And what does it mean for U.S.-Japanese relations? Well, first of all, it's terrific to be here. Thank you, Bob, and uh, to my colleagues on the uh, podium here and to CSIS and to John Hamry in particular. These are wonderful forums, and we're really uh, grateful for the opportunity to explore something as significant as this historic Japanese election. At, 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 it's important just basically to take a few minutes to appreciate uh, something that the United States and Japan share, which is uh, this tremendous commitment to democracy. So what we've seen is an enormously uh, important uh, election that took place peaceably, uh, in which uh, a, a very uh, new generation of leaders uh, have come to power in Japan. And so at a very uh, basic level, we recognize that, we celebrate it, and we appreciate it. And uh, I'd like to just say uh, today, uh, earlier today, uh, President Obama uh, reached uh, 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 Mr. Hatsuyama-san. Uh, they had a very good conversation. Uh, he thanked uh, 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 Hatsuyama-san for some uh, statements of late, the importance of the U.S.-Japan uh, relationship. He congratulated him on his victory and he told uh, uh, the Japanese uh, leadership of the uh, new party, DPJ, that uh, the United States stands ready to work uh, with Japan uh, over the course of the next several uh, weeks and months to ensure that our relationship is important going forward. Um, this is a very early time. You have to take great care uh, during initial steps. We're trying to send a very consistent message of our determination uh, to work closely and to consult with Japanese friends. Uh, we have a schedule for fairly deep engagement over the course of the next uh, several months to ensure uh, the highest possible uh, level of consultation. And I'm confident that uh, in terms of the basics, the fundamental issues that unite the United States and Japan, that those will remain in place. Uh, will there be some challenges along the way? Undoubtedly, there will be. But the truth is that we've faced challenges over decades. We've surmounted them. Um, we have worked closely together. And I think we have a lot of confidence that we'll be able to do that over the course of the next several months. The watchword from our uh, perspective uh, uh, right now, Bob, is, is patience, uh, commitment, and solidarity. So we feel very uh, we're excited about the election. We're excited about the, the path and uh, the way forward. Uh, we take nothing for granted in terms of uh, uh, expectations associated with, um, um, with, with uh, uh, issues beyond uh, our alliance. But we do think that the foundation is there for a very uh, strong relationship going forward. Uh, Michael Green, uh, you and many other analysts really nailed it. Uh, everyone saw this coming. But it is still... Uh, almost a shock that uh, one party has held power since, what, 1955, Five. and then they lose. It's just a total turnover. Right. I mean, they, they not only lose, but they, they lose big. What, yep. 300 out of 485 right. seats or something like that. Uh, why did it happen? Well, um, the Japanese voters in exit polls said why. Um, it wasn't because of Mr. Hatoyama. Only 3% said they made their vote because of him. It wasn't because of the DPJ's policies is because they were sick and tired of uh, the Liberal Democratic Party's style of politics and governance um, and the inability of the government to provide. Um, the Japanese economy has grown at about 1.9 percent a year for a decade. Um, and there's a sense that this just can't go on and things have to change. So this was a massive, massive uh, uh, victory for the opposition. Japanese elections lately have been massive. I mean, Koizumi for the LDP won a massive victory just a few years ago. Uh, so there's a lot of swing in the Japanese voters, and they were um, ready to throw the bums out and, uh, and give the new crew a try. And that's mo mainly what this was about. Um, it's not so clear that the Japanese public knows what the new government will do or has complete confidence in what they'll do, but they're ready to throw the dice. In, in other words, chance. this was not so much a vote for the new party right. as it was a vote against that's the right. old party. That's right. That's pretty policies. clear. That's pretty clear. It shows up in the polling. Um, there's some things that the, De Pan, uh, the Democratic Party promised. They're going to cut taxes and fees. They're going to stimulate the economy. Um, they're going to empower civil society more. Uh, they're going to beat up the bureaucracy and decentralize government. Those things were fairly popular. But in terms of the real fundamental challenges in Japan, uh, how to restore uh, long-term economic growth, 
what to do in foreign policy. There wasn't a clear affirmative vote for anything. It was just time to get rid of the old crew. Uh, and I talked to friends in rural Japan where I used to live who voted for the LDP their whole life, and they were giddy that they took this step and threw everyone out, but they weren't sure what came next. Uh, Steve, uh, when something like this happens, uh, there's always, America always becomes an issue, it seems like. It wasn't an, uh, so that you heard anti-American statements from, from uh, the new party uh, as they were coming to this election, but you heard them talk about we need more independence from America, uh, we need to separate. Uh, is this going to make a difference in the Japan uh, American alliance? And well, I was how writing, much is this going to change? I was writing a piece today that Yukio Hatoyama is going to find his inner Obama. Uh, and, and, and what I meant by that is that a lot of things said on the campaign trail um, are going to be softened, delayed, you know, priorities are going to be set. And, you know, there's the great Ariel Sharon line once uh, where sitting behind the prime minister's desk in Israel and he was responding and saying, you know, I, things look differently behind this desk and things will look differently behind Yukio Hatoyama's desk and what he puts forward. I think that uh, this is an exciting election in part because, uh, to be blunt, many people feel that the LDP sort of lost its ability to be flexible in a lot of key areas. In the past, the LDP was able to reinvent itself or throw in different leadership. That, that sort of ended. But you also had the impression, um, rightly or wrongly, that many Japanese felt that the U.S.-Japan relationship in a whole variety of fronts was just stuck too much in the past. And, and I've been one to sort of suggest as well that um, there was a kind of brewing nationalism that I would consider sort of nasty right-wing nationalism. I'm very happy that now we're going to see a sort of negotiated nationalism, and part of that will involve the relationship with the United States and where they take it. I, I don't, recently Yukio Hatoyama published in Huffington Post, of all places and in other places, a, a piece that was complaining about uh, the negative consequences on Japan of American-led kind of manic neoliberalism, if you will. Uh, and I made a comment today that a lot of Americans actually feel what Hatoyama was saying as well, and we've already had a shift here in this country uh, to some degree on these issues. But I. I think that when uh, the real strong man behind this, Ichido Ozawa, wrote his book on a blueprint for a new nation, a normal nation, in it, he didn't uh, destroy or dismantle the U.S.-Japan relationship. He talked about the importance of becoming a greater, greater stakeholder in that relationship, of sorting out Japan's interests more on their own, and changing the image, uh, to the degree it still exists, of Japan just being a puppet or a uh, a satellite of American interest exclusively and having a greater role in play. And I think this is, this is part of the Japanese narrative which has been growing and we should look at this as a healthy thing. And I predict a much healthier, lively, and somewhat of reinvented U.S.-Japan relationship in part because of Hatoyama talking about the need to create some distance. I actually think it's a good thing as opposed to what some people see in a zero-sum sense that this is going to cost us influence. I don't, I don't believe that at all. Mr. Secretary, from uh, well, go ahead. You want to just comment yeah, on that? I, I, I like both of what, uh, uh, what Steve and Mike have said. I, I actually think that um, for the alliance to maintain its relevance and its influence over the course of the first part of this century, a degree of independence, of confidence, is absolutely essential on the part of Japan. So I actually think that these are not, as has uh, um, just been reaffirmed, these are not in contrast with one another are actually essential. It's important that uh, uh, Japan feel confident and independent. And in fact, the United States supports that. We, we, don't, have, we don't see any uh, contradiction in terms of a close alliance and a greater uh, uh, independence in terms of uh, doing business. I think we will find that even in an independent mindset, we will find ourselves taking very similar positions. I also think that uh, one of the things that we've heard from DPJ friends is a desire to have a closer and deeper relationship uh, in Asia with both South Korea and China. Mm -hmm. And that has sometimes been posited as something that the United States either is against or threatened by. Nothing could be further from the case. We would like to see Japan play uh, a, a stronger leadership role as partners with friends in Asia, and we will support that. We also believe in that process they will come to appreciate and understand the significance of the U.S.-Japan alliance. So in in terms of the basics, we are very comfortable. I, I, I would also suggest to you, we see this in the United States. I wrote a book on transitions with my friend, uh, now Deputy Secretary Jim Steinberg. Transitions in democracies are difficult. This is going to be different than transitions that we've seen in the past in the LDP, where 
two days, new government, everything's back in place. This is going to take a period of time. Um, we're going to have to be patient. It's probably going to play out not just over a couple of weeks, but months. New means and mechanisms of, of making decisions uh, will be put in place. Um, if I had one caution, I would say my own personal experience is some of the finest professionals that I've worked with in Japan are bureaucrats. Uh, and I, I would hate to see uh, a period whereby somehow they are uh, posited as, as the enemy and somehow to be uh, uh, gone after. I, I, I think over time uh, many of our uh, uh, new friends that have just arrived in power will come to appreciate how strong uh, these men and women are, how much they've served uh, Japan's uh, interests uh, over the course of the last uh, several decades. Of course there can be changes, but, but overall there's been a lot of very good work done and we hope to continue our professional relationships with these people. From the United States standpoint, what are the most critical, the most important parts of this alliance? Um, what, what means most to us on this side? Well, um, I'll answer that. Let me just briefly, if I could, um, piggyback on what Kurt uh, and Steve said. Uh, there is this rhetoric and this narrative that has come out of the Democratic Party about distance from the U.S., closer to Asia. And it's important for perspective to understand where the Japanese people are. And I won't go through a lot of numbers, but very recent polls when the Japanese public was asked, do you feel close to the United States, 74% said yes. When they were asked, do you feel close to China, comparable numbers said no. Um, and across the board, the public opinion in Japan is, in some ways, has never been better about the uh, right. common interests and values of the U.S. So a lot of this rhetoric about distancing from the U.S., moving to Asia, I think comes out of a narrative that the Democratic Party in Japan used to try to attack the LDP because the government cooperated very closely with us because it was in Japan's national interest. Um, and they've, and it, we're seeing that rhetoric still. I think it's going to start dying out as these guys come into office and start looking at what do they do about North Korea, what do they do about the rise of China. Um, there are very few issues, actually, where we really disagree with Japan. Um, now, what's most important to us at a strategic level, um, you know, from the, from the middle of the Second World War, long-term strategic planners knew that the U.S. had to have a strong relationship with Japan for all of Asia to be stable. Um, and our foreign policy on a bipartisan basis has been based on that for 60 years. Um, we especially need it now with the rise of China, not that either the J Japan or the United States wants to contain China, but to provide a stable environment where we can both engage China from a position of confidence. Um, Japan is the second largest contributor still to the United Nations, uh, to most of the international institutions. So for international organizations to work, we've got to be with Japan, and we are. Um, we're very close to Japan in the G7 and G20 discussions. Um, we need Japan on the North Korean nuclear problem. And for our forward presence uh, across a, a hemisphere, uh, our bases in Japan are absolutely critical. Um, the DPJ has made some noises about changing the status of our forces, blocking Okinawa. Uh, I don't think they're going to want to go there because I think the Japanese uh, public also and the rest of the region recognizes how important these bases are. Uh, but those are the things I would say are, are uh, you know, and th that's a pretty long list of very yeah. critical interests. Do, do you see any of those changes coming or any of those things changes? changing in any uh, I think some, way. some change, not, not the major things, but I think that there'll be down the road, not on the front end of, this administ of the Hatoyama administration, but, but some changes in the edges, some you know, things that will make Kurt Campbell a bit crazy about wanting to renegotiate the rights of military uh, servicemen on bases and discussions about sovereignty and decision making. Um, I, I think there'll be some of that. I think Kurt will be ingenious at getting the Jap Japanese to move beyond the abductee issue as the be-all uh, uh, when they think about regional security and begin to look uh, more there. And I think that, that you're going to see, and what I hope happens, comes in to, to, to reify something Mike just laid out, Japan is some of the best international bureaucrats in the system. And one of the things that, that I feel that has been working against that you had Koichiro Matsura clean up UNESCO to the point where Jesse Helms actually supported going back. You had in the, in the High Commission for Refugees in, in peacekeeping, in, in, uh, in, in uh, uh, IAEA. You've got uh, in, in, in the Bretton Woods institutions. And Japan used to combine a kind of commitment to security through a notion of interdependence in this system that in ways that, were, that took the pressure off the United States from being that player 
And I think there's been some muting of that. I would love to see a return to it because I th actually think it helped us, it helped the relationship, and it reminded people of the vitality and importance of Japan. I think Japan, uh, if I can be blunt, is despite the interest in this room and C-SPAN and all of the others, is the taken for granted ally. I think Japan, during the Gulf, or the, uh, uh, the second Gulf War, during the Iraq War, decided to stop challenging the United States on key trade issues, economic issues, and become our pal in a lot of things, and to subordinate a lot of its tensions. What's interesting, if you don't have points of tension with another country, particularly the United States, you're not taken seriously. And I think somewhat the U.S.-Japan relationship has a lot less visibility than it should have given its weight because we didn't have that. That's why I'm very excited about this sort of democracy 2.0 moment as I see it in Japan. And I think we're going to see Japan rise in relevance and, 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 and significance and consequence in the eyes of Congress, which I think has been undertending this relationship and underaware of it because they're having this. So I, when, when you look at this combined portfolio uh, and asking, you know, going along what Mike said, I think you're going to see renewed interest and you're going to see hopefully Japan come back to some of these these international institutions in which which it, it, it's very useful for us and I think it will return them back to mm -hmm. prominence internationally. Are, are we on the same page uh, with Japan on uh, on Korea? On the Korea? On, on, the, on North Korea? Yes, well, yeah. and, and South Korea. As well. Both, well, in both respects, yes. I think um, uh, even before the outreach from uh, President Obama, there have already been conversations between Hatiyama-san and his Korean uh, counterpart, uh, the President Im, and they have underscored their desire to work more closely together. And I think one of the things that we've seen over several years is a tendency uh, in certain circumstances for a variety of reasons to suddenly see South Korean-Japanese uh, uh, Japanese South Korean relations take a nosedive. And ultimately, that's not in our interests either. We want to see our two closest allies working more closely together, if I may say, focusing more on the future than on the past. And I think we see uh, very real prospects of that going forward. So in that, that's our basic uh, issue, and I think uh, we're going to see uh, 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 very good work in this uh, uh, area going forward. On North Korea, um, it's still early. I think, uh, I, th I think at a very general level, the United States and Japan share basic beliefs. We will not accept uh, a nuclear North Korea. Uh, we are committed uh, uh, to a diplomatic process whereby we, through the six-party framework, we try uh, in some uh, uh, future period to sit down with North Korea if they accept the commitments that they have taken in 2005. And so I, I, I think you will see uh, that the United States and Japan will work closely together on North Korea. And so I, I mean, I hate to say this, Bob, we are pretty much in violent agreement here about areas where I think we can work together. I think one of just the real challenges is I, I don't think we fully appreciate how difficult it is, how wholesale a change this is likely to be in terms of a whole new group of people. Remember, this is not just a new group of people coming into the executive branch. This is a new group of people, many of whom have never been in power, who are not only going to be in the legislative branch, but will also be serving in some capacities in the executive branch. Th there is a tremendous discipline and rigor associated with power, and it can be brutal. It can be very challenging, and we see that playing out not only in the United States and transitions. We see it playing out uh, in other places. This is a whole new generation of people uh, who are experiencing this together for the first time. And so I think, I, I think one of the things that we have to be careful about is not to have unrealistic expectations in the short term about clear, coherent policy statements. It may take time for them to be uh, able to fully enunciate. And I think we have to be um, uh, patient and also understand that there are going to be some stray flares and some comments made that perhaps make people anxious and recognize that we have to be much more focused on the ballast and the boat, which are these larger issues that uh, really unite the United States and Japan. Um, go ahead. I, I just wanted to add one, one point to, to, to affirm something Kurt said that it hasn't been getting a lot of press, but 
this party with, with, with 300 plus um, uh, members is going to have to hire staff people, train staff people, educate them about the legislative process. When you get beyond the sort of sexy topics that you're fighting over, 99% of the legislative work that that, that party is going to be responsible for doesn't get all the headlines. There's a whole infrastructure within the LDP that's been there in place for decades that essentially much of the sort of internal organs of policy and legislative work don't exist in any mature way within the DPJ, not to the same level. And, and so there's another, there's sort of the back shop questions, which I think are even more disconcerting and, and, and can handicap the government. And actually, I think while you'll have a few public hangings of bureaucrats, ultimately those bureaucrats end up becoming a vital part of it. Because you, So I, I just wanted to throw that out there that they're going to have a lot of handicaps. There's also um, the DPJ has had the luxury of not having to come to a conclusion on key economic and foreign policy issues because they rode this wave of resentment against the guys currently in power. And there are a variety of views uh, on all the issues we've been talking about. There's, there's not a clear consensus within the party on whether they should continue refueling operations in the Indian Ocean to help the coalition in Afghanistan, what to do about the Okinawa Agreement. Um, I, I suspect what will happen is that the, that the politicians who learn how to work with the bureaucracy are, are going to be the ones who have the information, the insights, the power to actually govern and survive. Um, so uh, the, the DPJ has said they're going to have politicians run everything. Uh, the, the smart politicians are the ones who will marry themselves to the right bureaucracy and get things done. I also think Kurtz articulated exactly the right strategy for the Obama administration. Don't put pressure. Be patient. Help work through a strategy together. Um, focus on a relationship between Atiyama and President Obama. There are issues they're going to have to make decisions on, though. They're going to have to decide what to do about the Indian Ocean. They're going to have to make decisions on North Korea policy. Uh, what worries me a little bit is, this is not um, at all a criticism of what Kurt said, Kurt said. I think he's right. What worries me is, having not resolved some of these internal contradictions, um, this new government may not be able to come up with uh, uh, a decision. And as a default position, will sort of punt and pass on key decisions. Um, and the last thing I'd say is I think um, Steve's right. There are people like Ambassador Matsura and others who are, who are in international organizations. We should be actively supporting uh, more Japanese leadership uh, and, and, and personnel in the UN and elsewhere. Um, I, uh, where I would disagree, I think, if I understood you, Steve, was good. The, idea, the idea that <laughs> Japan being difficult and becoming interesting is good for U.S.-Japan relations or Japan's position in the world. A lot of the DPJ narrative has been very narrowly focused on the U.S., we're sending people to Iraq and Afghanistan because of the U.S. We're doing this because of the U.S. What I hope will happen is the new government will come in, and they'll step back, stop worrying about the U.S. so much, and think about whether their policies on Afghanistan, on economic reconstruction in, in, in Iraq, on, uh, on revitalizing their own economy, the international financial crisis, think about whether these are credible internationally. Because what, what is credible to us is going to be credible to India, to Britain, to Canada, to Korea. Um, and so I'm hoping that they'll step out a little bit of this U.S.-Japan prism, mm -hmm. which they've criticized the government for, and step back and think through what will make Japan influential and credible globally. And if they do that, I think they'll move in, 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 in the right direction. Can, can I say one sure. other thing on this, Bob, if I may? Just the other thing is let, let's, uh, let's reflect that the, our Japanese, new Japanese friends and government are not just talking to us. They're talking with a range of other countries. It is um, gratifying how many other countries have gone to the Japanese and said, look, job number one, yes, we want good bilateral relationships with you, but make sure the U.S.-Japan relationship is strong. And so they're hearing that not just from the United States, people in government and out of government, but from a whole range of countries, not just in Asia. I want to uh, go to questions in the audience sooner than we normally do because actually we just have so many experts here today. And first I'd like to call on the Japanese Ambassador Fujisaki uh, Mr. Ambassador, would you like to uh, make some comments here, or would you like to even ask a question? Uh, and would you go to the microphone? There's a microphone. We'd uh, love for you to go to the microphone. Sure. If you Taish. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yes. Stand yes. Up. Please. It's a lot of cameras. <laughs> In my country, uh, they're saying that uh, if the three people gets together, it would produce Buddhist wisdom. With these three pundits, <laughs> huge wisdom, so there's not much to add to what uh, they've said. And especially, uh, the new government hasn't started yet, and I'm not in a position to interpret what Mr. Hatoyama or 
what the DPJ is saying. But uh, I'd like to just to make a, a couple points. On economy, I think what Mr. Hadoyama is saying is that he's not denying market forces in globalism, but if we leave everything to market alone, <coughs> it may not produce the best result for the people, so that needs adjustment. And the guiding principle of adjustment is fraternity, the concept, and that is, in short, to care about others. And I think, as Steve said, it, it is also here in the United States as well that government is having a bigger role in adjusting economy. The second point is about US-Japan relations. Uh, Mr. Harem is saying that uh, he's seeking for constructive and future-oriented relations uh, between Japan and the United States. Uh, and I think uh, uh, it is true that uh, there are some differences between incumbent uh, government and the incoming government on some of the issues. However, what is most important is that DPJ as well as LDP is saying that Japan-US relations will continue to be the cornerstone or the foundation of Japan's foreign policy. My last point is that uh, I've been always saying that in managing important relations like Japan-US, three points are important. I've been saying it, it has three no's. No surprise. No over-politicizing things. And lastly, no taking for granted. And I think these are more true than ever when the two administration gets together. That's my personal comment. Thank you very much. All right. Other uh, questions from the audience? If you could come, could you come up? You, go ahead. You're holding your hand up. There you go. I think it worked. I think it worked. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, um, it's not working. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I'm Hisao Takasaka of CSIS. I'd like to ask you uh, ask a uh, simple but uh, difficult question, hard, hard question to uh, particularly particularly to Dr. Campbell. Under the Japanese political atmosphere of um, continuing and increasing frustration, seeking for change, it is naturally getting difficult to manage the sensitive issues such as Okinawa issues for, or for both Japanese government and U.S. government um, both. And this brings any possibility that U.S. government allows or give Jap uh, Japanese government some room of maneuver such as uh, giving more time to cool down so on the uh, relocate, relocation issue of uh, U.S. Marine, US Marine to Guam or to, uh, to accept some new proposal from uh, Japanese, new Japanese government to review some U.S. forces station, uh, stationing uh, agreement and so on. Thank you. Okay. Jack uh, Curry, would you yes, like to I, I'll start just, on that? Yeah, and I, I know Michael want to say, I'll, I'll just say something directly. First of all, uh, one of the things they teach you at the State Department is to repeat what your spokesman has said. So <laughs> R Rusty, uh, Rust Rusty Dimming, Dimming taught me that. It took years to learn, but I finally, <laughs> I finally mastered it. Um, and I think on, on this particular issue, I would refer you to what our State Department spokesman said about our expectations about going ahead here. I, I would just say, however, there are expectations that we're going to make progress. Um, uh, the issues on Okinawa uh, have, have been with us a long time. We've made some progress and we'd like to continue, and it's very important to us, and we feel like we've worked closely with the government of Japan. We're going to continue to work closely. Um, uh, but I would also stand by the statement that our uh, press secretary made yesterday. Thanks. What is going to be uh, the uh, relationship between Japan and China? Do I'd just like to throw that on the table. Do you all see that changing? It's going to be a fun and interesting roller coaster ride. I, I, in, in my view, I think Japan um, 
is is uh, going to be in a position where it has to try to work with other states in moving, you know, 1.1 billion, as Clyde Press would call them, new capitalists into a different in a, into a different arena and and somehow deal with. Uh, China's interest in pretensions. When I was at the, I tell a joke that it, it was actually a real issue that a few years ago I was in Beijing and visited the director of policy planning at China's Ministry of Foreign Affairs and I said, what are you working on? And he says, how to keep you Americans distracted in small Middle Eastern countries. Um, and I think that at the time there was significant criticism by Japan privately uh, tr communicated to the Bush administration of the absence of uh, high-level American uh, government officials at key summits in Asia. And one of the things I was very pleased by with Secretary Clinton is, and, and she's doing it globally, is a real presence, going to Japan first, being in Asia, uh, putting in FaceTime. It really makes a difference because I think that there has been some distraction because of uh, uh, other issues. And, and, and I think that that helps Japan somewhat deal with China and its growth and its pretensions in the region. At the same time, Ch Japan's going to invest in China, but it's also got important identity and history issues that I hope that you see more mature leadership on both sides because I've, I've often uh, said that one of the negative consequences, the moral hazards of the strong American military engagement in the region is it, is it prompts irresponsible uh, behavior by Korean, Japanese, and Chinese leaders who want to uh, exploit on a short-term basis you know, a kind of virulent nationalism because they know there's not going to be conflict because we're there, so they can get away with it. And I hope we, we move out of that phase. I hope that doesn't mean that the conclusion is that if the U.S. pulls militarily out of Asia, they'll learn to be encouraging responsible. <laughs> <laughs> That's not a, anyway. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure we want to test that thesis uh, necessarily or that in any administration here will. Um, but um, Japan, China, Asia has historically had hierarchical relationships among the big powers. And Lee Kuan Yew and others have said this is the first time where Japan and China are powerful at the same time. Right. Um, now, China's moving up, but Japan's got an awful lot of national power. And it's deeply uncomfortable. You can see it in the opinion polls um, and the deep anxiety about China in Japan. It's Chinese submarines circumnavigating Japan. It's nuclear weapons. It's Chinese blocking Japan in diplomatic, uh, in diplomatic uh, negotiations around the world, including the UN Security Council effort. It's uh, poisoned uh, gyoza, dumplings. Um, it's, a, it's pretty broad. And yet at the same time, uh, China has been Japan's largest trading partner, larger than us, for about four years now. So it's a very complicated mix of rivalry and interdependence mm -hmm. that fundamentally won't change. In the near term, I think this government has been very clear, this new government, Hatayama, Okada, and others, they want to try to move closer to China. They won't emphasize history issues. Uh, that's a good thing, as Kurt pointed out. It's in our interests for Japan and China to, to work towards a closer relationship. It doesn't help us when there's tension. Um, I think Steve's right when he says roller coaster, though, because I'm not sure how sustainable that is. And there may even be a little bit of a danger that if the Hatayama government tries too hard, they're going to start provoking a reaction at home because of the deep anxiety about China. So complicated roller coaster, um, but but some good initial steps. You want to say add anything? No. To that? I want to. Uh, all right. Who's uh, all right? Right here. John Zan with CPI TV of Taiwan. A uh, quick follow up to uh, John Zan with CPI TV of Taiwan. A quick follow up to uh, Bob's question. The question is for uh, uh, Secretary uh, Campbell and other panelists. Um, we all know that uh, Taiwan has long been a very important factor in uh, um, Japan-China uh, relationship and U.S.-China relationship. How do you see uh, the, uh, Taiwan being affected in the new uh, um, Japan-China relationship and uh, the new uh, Japan-U.S. relationship? Thank you very much. Okay. Um, well, I, I see continuity in the U.S. sense. I think the administration has started off very clearly in terms of our international commitments. We worked very closely over the course of the last uh, several weeks in a, in a, in a humanitarian effort uh, in response to the tragedy uh, in Taiwan with the typhoon. And I think you're going to see uh, a dialogue and appropriate interaction, uh, unofficial interaction between the United States and Taiwan. Um, I'm going to leave it to Mike to talk about what we think we might expect to see between um, uh, Japan and uh, Taiwan and indeed other countries. I, I, I would say uh, one thing about the overall campaign generally. 
there has been probably more of a focus on domestic issues and financial issues than there was on international issues. That doesn't mean anything necessarily going forward, but I think as a general proposition that was the case. In terms of specifics outside of the U.S.-Japan relations and some general statements about wanting to have a closer relationship with Asia, one of the positives in some respects for any incoming government is that they are in some respects unencumbered by an enormous number of commitments. The platform is relatively general. And I don't think actually there's been much said about this or other issues, but I'd leave it to Mike and others to comment on that. I think there will be a variety of views on Taiwan inside the DPJ, just as there was a variety of views within the LDP, just as there's a variety of views within the Republican and Democratic parties. Uh, if, you're, if you're watching this closely, then I'd see who's foreign minister, because there are some people in the DPJ who uh, want to do a lot to improve relations with China um, and may cut corners on relations with Taiwan to do it. And there are others who are quite pro-Taiwan. So I won't go into names, but um, there, are, there are different views on this. Um, but in general, I think Kurt's right. I think the, 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 the thawing of cross-straits relations has made it easier for everyone else to manage their Taiwan policy, at least for now. And so I wouldn't expect any big changes. Okay. Next question. Uh, here. Right here. She's got a mic there, I think. Uh, Paul Eckert of Reuters News Agency. Uh, following on that theme, uh, you know that the, and I think this is probably a Mike Green question, uh, the DPJ is a broad umbrella of uh, factions and some are right-leaning. And uh, I'm wondering if it's possible that, uh, you know, the sort of the history view that they're going to probably deal with with Asia will raise hackles on that side of the party and you, you could have another cabinet minister saying something or doing something provocative. You'll recall that during the non-LDP government of the early 90s, they were also plagued by that because they, they assembled a group of right-leaning people in their cabinet. You know, I think um, there, there's breathing room on the history issue. <clears throat> I, don't, I, I think that, uh, that Hatsuyama's promise not to go to the shrine, it did not cause any great backlash in the political debate in Japan. I think, I think on the history issue, there's, for the time being, there's a little bit of room. Uh, and, I, and I think that, uh, that, 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 that the, there will not be pressure within the DPJ. But you're right to point out that there are very different views within the party. There are probably 40 or 50 members of the DPJ who are as conservative as the most conservative LDP. Kurt makes a very good point about um, where they're going to focus their political capital. And uh, I think they're, as Kurt suggests, they're going to focus on changing the domestic political economy. Because the reality is we're all excited about this big change, but it's possible that in three months or six months, these guys will be gone. That, that some crisis or some mismanagement could cause realignment. Um, they have to win in the upper house election next summer um, so if you're Rishiro Ozawa, the architect of this victory and the guy who wants to win next summer for the DPJ, you don't want to push foreign policy issues that split your party. You don't want to fight with the Obama administration. President Obama has 82% support in Japan. Hatsuyama-san has somewhere between 30 and 50% support. There's not a whole lot of political hay to be made with a big fight with the U.S. Um, so I think that's one more reason why you'll see a lot more focus on changing the domestic political economy, starting to steal away interest groups and constituencies from the LDP and get ready to really knock it to them, which is what Ichiro Ozawa, the Karl Rove of Japan, uh, is, is, really all, is really all about. Yeah. But what I'd like to just quickly... Karl or Ichiro Ozawa? <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to just quickly respond, because your, your point got to a very good point. In the early 1980s, Henry Kissinger wrote an article um, critiquing the LDP and saying one of the reasons you couldn't negotiate with the LDP or know what they're doing because it had all these factions and each faction thought something different about policy. I remember it because it was my first letter to a newspaper that was published and said, you know, Dr. Kissinger, with all due respect, you're quite wrong because the factions were not driven by policy differences but power differences. And, but Henry Kissinger's article, which if it were resurrected, would be completely true about the DPJ today, where it's not just about power inside the party. You're going to have an incredible policy heterodoxy among a very large apparatus institution, which they haven't figured out 
quite how to discipline that yet and how to create conflict management mechanisms to move forward. And we've seen that in the sort of rotating leadership with, you know, Khan and Okada and Hato Yama, or all themselves not, you know, and, and Seiji Maihara uh, and others are, are, are going to have to figure that out. But it's not just them, it's, it's, it's other folks too. Somebody ought to, I'll look up that Kissinger piece and bring it back. But in that sense, that's a real handicap when it comes to moving and, and, it, and, it, and, and they've got to figure that out soon. And I don't, from, from my sources, I, I, I don't think they have. I would just add, yeah. Dr. Kissinger called earlier and asked if you were going to be here. Yeah. Was, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, Otherwise, he would have been here. But it, it, it's also just... He uh, always knows. It, it, it's also not clear that uh, the DPJ will replicate exactly this factional approach right. Right. to politics that the LPJ did. And right. the truth is that that approach sometimes makes it difficult to do the kind of policy concessions, dialogue, implementation that you see in successful democracy. So uh, I, I agree very much, you know, jury's still out um, and, and we'll see. But this is an enormous party which, with a very wide uh, set of views on uh, almost every imaginable <laughs> issue. You know, factions were easier because yeah, at least you knew who to go easier. to. <laughs> and, and, and this right. would be a bit amorphous. Uh, Ambassador Paul Wolfowitz is over here. Uh, Hi, Paul Wolfowitz. Yeah, I, this has sort of been addressed, I guess, with the last question, but I'm curious whether any of you think that the desire to improve relations with China might push Japan to do something more than just fewer visits to the Yasukuni Shrine. It's striking when you compare Japan and Germany how what a great job the Germans have done in addressing their past and what a poor job the Japanese have done. And they talk about improving relations with China, and yet this always comes up as an issue with China. Do you think there's any possibility of, with all the other issues they have to address, that they might do something more than just not too many visits to Yasukuni? Joe and Lai said in the early 70s that this history issue would take at least three generations to uh, reconcile. And I've never known how long a generation is, but I don't think we're there yet. 20 years. Um, 20 years. 20 years. Well, <laughs> um, not too long from now. Um, the... The, prop, the difference, obviously, I, I think, between J Japan and China and France and Germany is that um, the, the, the Chinese have not done what France obviously could do, which is uh, internal reconciliation about their own history uh, and the history of the Communist Party. And in my view, until China can reconcile internally, it won't happen with Japan. Not to put all the burden on China, but that's one big obstacle. On the Japanese side, the more... Uh, uh, taboos fade and the more debate there is, the harder it is to keep people quiet and, and, and the more voices will come out on history issues that make it difficult. Um, but as I was saying earlier, I think we are entering a period where at least there will be some thawing uh, and, and maybe we'll sort of ratchet it down for the longer term or maybe we'll be in for a roller coaster a little while. Right here. Thanks so much. Uh, Chris Nelson, Nelson Report. Uh, Mike said he was going to write my question for me, but he forgot, so I'm going to ask Kurt okay. uh, all on my own. Um, <laughs> uh, we've already mentioned that one of the potential uh, disconnects, if not properly coordinated, is how do we talk to and with North Korea and about what? And the administration has been very consistent <laughs> in saying we're not going to talk to them except in terms of negotiations about uh, denuclearization along the lines of the previous agreement. There is a lot of pressure to go and negotiate with them to see if that's it's possible to negotiate, uh, which gets us into a chicken and egg problem. Uh, and until the Japanese uh, work out how they're going to think about us dealing with the North, um, it might be helpful if you could walk us through a bit how you're seeing this chicken and egg problem at the moment. Uh, what's the difference between mm -hmm. uh, discussions and negotiations and Steve Bosworth going to talk but not deal unless they say in advance it's going to be about the bomb, so that sort of thing. Yeah. Thank I mean, you. Much of this is... Uh, as you know, Chris, uh, very far ahead of where we are right now. And I think, I think it's well known to many people here who follow Asia. Steve Bosworth and Ambassador Sun Kim are on a plane today for consultations uh, with our allies uh, uh, in uh, Japan, uh, South Korea, uh, and China to talk about next steps. Uh, no commitments have been made about either talks, uh, discussions, uh, diplomacy, negotiations at all. Nothing vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, North Korea. We're at an early stage in which we are um, uh, 
presenting some ideas about how to go forward uh, with both Japan, South Korea, and China. Uh, I think the basics of that, Chris, are still um, uh, very clear. We are committed to the six-party framework. Um, we think that the most important agreements with North Korea are embedded in that process, particularly in 2005. We, um, I think, are united in our belief that uh, we must see a, a commitment and a clear and firm commitment um, uh, from no North Korea backed up by um, uh, irreversible steps, uh, that uh, commitment to a nuclear-free North Korea. And uh, we have other issues that we're going to want to discuss associated with um, proliferation and the like. Uh, overall, uh, we're at the earliest possible stages. We've just come out of six or seven months of some severe provocations. We uh, continue to implement um, UN Resolution 1784. And I would just underscore on that, um, despite some of this discussion about next steps in uh, discussions or dialogue, one of the most interesting things that has happened in recent uh, months uh, is uh, other countries, not just in Asia, but in the Middle East and others, are beginning to take steps to implement 1784 and aspects of the PSI. And I think that is an, an indication that it's just not the United States and other countries in Asia, but countries in the Middle East and elsewhere that appreciate and understand that some of these provocative steps, transfers of, of dangerous technologies, are not only bad for countries in the region, but also uh, globally. So I think overall what you will see over the course of the next several uh, months are closer interactions uh, uh, with uh, uh, Korea. Clearly, they're in the process of reevaluating their own interactions with North Korea. China has been in the process of a rather deep reflection on North Korea now for several months. And clearly, we have to give Japan some time uh, to formulate if they're going to have a different uh, uh, set of uh, perspectives on North Korea. We've got to give them time, and we recognize that their views on North Korea and this uh, process of uh, five parties, uh, uh, it's essential to keep them engaged. So that's, that's where we are, Chris. And so I can't get in advance to you what will look like negotiations and what is our um, uh, specific approach to uh, various issues because we're actually well before that in this process. All right. Uh, do we have any women that want to ask a question? So far it's been an all-male yeah, show here. One right there. This lady right here. Michelle Jamrisco, Kyoto News. Setting aside the larger security and economic and other issues for the moment, could you name a few things in the short term that the new Japanese government can do to reassure the U.S.? Um, Mr. Campbell, you mentioned uh, not throwing out the bureaucrats as the enemy. And Mr. Green, you, you said that the China engagement would be good. Are there other things that they could do in the next few months that we could see? Michelle, I'm sorry. I didn't recognize you over there. <laughs> can I just say, uh, just on, on the on – the issue of the bureaucrats, that is not a, you know, government coordinated position on the part of the United States. It's, it, you know, like, you know, we, we got together today and said we've got to keep the bureaucrats. That's not what I was suggesting. I was making a personal observation of the people that I have worked with. And so, um, despite just, your job, Kurt, nobody yeah. looks at you as a bureaucrat. I know. That's, I'll, leave, I'll leave that to the side. But I, I, I think there's some issues that you're, we're going to look to see uh, uh, a commitment uh, on the part of Japan. The UN General Assembly is coming up. The truth is, as, as, as both of my colleagues have underscored, Japan's leadership role in the United Nations is just essential. Um, and it's a leadership role. It's not a followership, followership role. We don't follow, they, don't, they, they take initiatives on a range of issues. We want to see that activism continue uh, at the United Nations. And we'll see, hopefully, some evidence of that later this month. I'd like to uh, uh, see a, a continuing commitment from Japan on climate change, on the issues associated in the lead-up to some very difficult negotiations in, 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 in Copenhagen. Uh, and I think there are a, a range of other uh, international global health issues. We're coming into the flu season. Japan has played an incredibly important role in some of the aspects associated with the, the early steps on H1N1. So, I mean, those are some basic steps. But I think overall, um, continuing a course that Japan has been on will be an important uh, contribution to maintenance of peace and stability and sort of a activist global role? I think uh, the um, – I'm not in the government, so I can say this. I think the kind of tone in the New York Times and Huffington Post article 
about globalization and American-led capitalism is all fine during an election campaign. Yeah. The transition, Kurt and I have worked on election campaigns. Our candidates have said things that we kind of you know, scratch our heads. And um, Some advisors get something into a speech, and everyone else in the party regrets it. And these things happen. An early indication, not <laughs> an early, <laughs> I won't give examples. An early indication uh, to me will be if this rhetoric stops when they come into power September 16, 17, whatever it is. It's not particularly helpful. It helps explain the philosophy. You don't need it when you're in government. That would be one thing. I think um, that, that right now my sense is that the DPJ is testing in the U.S. to see what they can get away with from the various promises they made about stopping ships in Afghanistan and uh, in the Indian Ocean and this and that and the other thing. And, and an early good sign would be if they stop asking which of their wish lists they could have and start a dialogue with the administration about what they can do. Um, you know, instead of saying, we don't want to send ships to the Indian Ocean, a dialogue based on what can we do in Afghanistan. Let's put the ships aside for now. What can we do? And here's, here's, here are the resources Japan has. That kind of proactive agenda with the Obama administration. Here's what, you know, yes, we can. <laughs> here's the kinds of things... Japan can do. And they can, you know, it'll be their decision, and obviously and there'll be a menu. Um, but right now, my sense is the interactions are, well, we said in the campaign we wouldn't do this. Is it okay if we don't do it? Move away from the can't do, start an agenda and a, and a dialogue, and here's what Japan can do. Um, that would Im immediately be recognized, not only in the U.S., but in other countries as a sign. These, these, are, these are people who really want to keep Japan in the, in the international, um, I was going to say in the fight, but in the, in the, in the, in the, in the problem-solving business internationally. You know, if I can, you know, um, uh, a short while ago, a, sh a, sh a few months ago, the Japan American Society of Southern California had its 100th anniversary. And I went back for that, a uh, big dinner, Universal Studios, maybe some of you were there. Um, Ambassador Fujisaki was there, and, and, and this is all cleared by him to put on the record. And I, I had joked with him about the importance of Taro Aso, the, the former prime minister, being Barack Obama's first official guest at the White House, first official foreign leader guest. And I asked him what, how, how high the price was. And he goes, oh, Steve, that's such, you know, decade-old thinking. We're not in that anymore. But at the point, you know, in my view of why Barack Obama invited Taro Aso to, to, that, um, to have that place, is very important, is on the international economic questions. I don't believe that the global financial heart attack is over. I think there are significant challenges ahead on how to deal with uh, the, 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 the problem of developing countries. Japan still sits on today the largest discretionary capital pile in the world larger than China in terms of what we can do. The financing and whatnot is very important. Japan has severe economic problems. But what it can do and the parameters of what it can do in the international economic order are absolutely vital. And I think, in my view, the impression is that Japan has been somewhat internally consumed and not playing at its weight, if you will, in this, in this international level. So one of the things I think it needs to do, and one of the things I think Barack Obama is very focused on, is our partners and, and, and co-stewards, if you will, of a revitalized international economy. And Japan has got to move into that, I think is moving into that forward, and I think that mm -hmm. Hatoyama and others need to show their ability to play in that game. I like we both of these. Can I, just, I like both of these. I would just say one thing. I'm just struck by as we're, as we're talking this. We're assuming, or at least I've actually assumed, that, that, that we will have sort of a placid period, uh, you know, leisurely in a sense, where a new government can come up to speed. The truth is, Global politics has a way of testing new leaders, right. whether in the United States or elsewhere. And we just don't know whether we'll have that luxury in Japan or elsewhere. Can you imagine uh, Joe Biden saying in six months, Yukio Hatoyama will be tested? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, chairman, <laughs> the yeah. chairman of CSIS is in the audience. Uh, Senator Nunn, would you like to uh, give us our final question or maybe have a comment here? Well, first, Bob, I want to thank uh, TCU and the uh, Chief of School of Journalism for uh, sponsoring this series of programs. This has been an outstanding panel today. Kurt, we're glad to have you back. Steve, Mike, we're glad to have you here. Uh, you've done a great job, Bob, and we appreciate the uh, School of Journalism, both naming the school after you and also assigning you to this uh, important task working with CSIS. It's terrific. Uh, I have been reminded today by the panel, uh, I think, unanimous view that uh, politicians should not... Uh, on their own try to frame questions, uh, that we need bureaucrats and staff people for that purpose. <laughs> but nevertheless, I'll close with the one question, and that is energy and environment. Did it come up much in the campaign or the nuclear issue? Were either any of those uh, big issues, or do you expect any significant change 
in the new government. So I'm, I'm thinking now of the headline from this panel, which is former and current bureaucrats and staffers <laughs> tell Japan, be good to bureaucrats and staffers. Um, <laughs> uh, Hire more. <laughs> um, well, the, uh, Steve made a really good point about Japan not getting credit uh, for all it can do and all it has done. Um, significant pledges to the IMF, but also very significant targets for climate change. And the DPJ has actually, in their uh, campaign manifesto, one-upped the LDP yes. in, in, the, in the cuts that they have pledged to make in emissions. I, I, I think it, they'll find it very hard, but they are definitely setting uh, you know, the, their pendant very far forward on climate change. Um, and that's one. Um, on nuclear power, it'll be interesting. The, the, uh, the DPJ has a bit of a, a more of a mixed set of views on nuclear power in Japan. Um, uh, but I think generally Japan will keep, as everyone has had to, moving in the direction of more nuclear power. Uh, they have on the proliferation side of energy, they have put out a lot of, uh, of signals they want to do more on reducing nuclear weapons, uh, uh, you know, on Article 6 of the NPT, Conventional Test Ban Treaty. Um, not a lot of specifics yet, um, but I think there's a lot of uh, potential there for the U.S. and other countries to work with the new government, see what Japan can do um, in terms of realistic policies to, uh, to reduce nuclear weapons and to deal with proliferation. There's a lot of idealism in what they've put out. I think the mainstream in Japan is still very, very concerned about the credibility of the extended nuclear deterrent. We shouldn't be um, confused by this. Uh, yes, there's an idealistic overlay and a desire to do this, but right beneath it is a real concern about the credibility of our extended deterrent. So this is a really ripe area for us to not only reassure Japan, but I think for Kurt and others to come up with a very proactive agenda uh, to take some of these um, ambitious views that the new government has on nuclear weapons and put them into practice. Steve, why don't you? Uh, yeah, just just very quickly, you know, with, without. Uh, uh, I, I agree with everything Mike said on the on, on the nuclear weapons issue, on the energy environment issue. These were very big issues. I mean, because in, in, in the DBJ was essentially talking about quality of life issues. Uh, at the local level and trying to improve that, but then also jumping from that to sort of global qual qual quality of life. And it ha sounded very Obama-esque. I actually think Hatoyama sounds like a very Obama-esque character. And frankly, from a policy perspective of talking to the policy staff again uh, to make a, a play for the bureaucrats there within the DPJ, they, they see lots of opportunities uh, given Japan's particular skill sets and strengths of really being the innovative driving force of green economy, and I think much more so, frankly, than the United States is in a position to be. Um, and so on, on energy environment, I think the, they see these things as, as areas of collaboration, strength, skill. We recently had, um, you know, and, and I think they look at the move the United States is moving in. And we had the, the, the chairman of the, the folks that run the Shinkansen in here recently trying to say, we'll give you our technology to help make uh, the Shinkansen work in the United States. They see all of this as, a, as essentially a business economic opportunity for revitalization of Japan. And, and the DPJ has been has been trumpeting that. So, Secretary, why don't you close Good. it out? Just for first of all, terrific. I hope you know, when we have our next meeting on U.S.-Japan relations, we have the same number of people here, <laughs> and that we can exactly. sustain this interest. And uh, just want to as thank as long you. as you're here, they'll be here. Yeah, that's sure. I'm sure that's the case. <laughs> that's, <laughs> and other fired bureaucrats. Yeah. Um, uh, and, and thank both my colleagues for being here. Sure. Gentlemen, thank you all in for TCU and CSI. Thanks all thank you, Mike. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. 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 Thanks.